Kia ora. I am Courtney, affectionately also known as Court. And welcome to Socialism for Dummies. Now, a funny bit of backstory, when I when the first this concept was first first, it was mostly because uh, we did a little bit of a hey, what do you guys want to hear about? And I was sort of like, everything, because I don't know anything. And uh, and I came up with a socialism for dummies, and there was a bit of a discourse about whether or not that was like politically correct. And I was like, excuse me, I am the literal dummy. I don't know anything, and I would like to know some things. Please just hand it to me. But uh, it was a good idea because, you know, it's the start of the year. And what better a time to kind of go back to basics and really what is socialism? Because honestly, I don't know. But it's also kind of hilarious because I'm also on the exec. <laughs> so if you think there's a barrier to entry to the exec for not knowing anything, trust me, there is. Just, you know, bear that in mind for the, the next AGM. Uh, yeah, and uh, so anyway, I'm caught, um, 27 years old. And uh, I haven't been in the Socialist Society for long. Uh, I've probably been a year, but I was introduced to it earlier because another fellow exec member I was friends with in my workplace, and I started complaining about, you know, capitalist stuff. And she was sort of like, hey, you have the brain cells, at least one. You should come along for these talks that we have that we talk about things that are, you know, <laughs> not capitalism. And I was like, huh. But uh, I just struggled in the beginning because I felt like the lectures were a little bit out of my depth, like I didn't really know what was going on. And um, so now that I've thrown myself in the deep end by joining the exec, I was like, let's bring it right back to basics, the court, and for the benefit of hopefully other people in the room. Um, Right, so yeah, Court 27, um, I work at a, I'm not going to name it, it's probably yes, but I work at a steel uh, distribution place. I'm the distribution continuous improvement specialist, and I get paid to do fuck all. And I think that sucks, and I'd rather do more fulfilling work. And um, I think it's cool for crazy that I used to get paid way less to do a way more important function. There's other things I'm mad about, but essentially that's me and that's why I'm, I'm here. So, my colleague, comrade, uh, Martin, is here to help me on my journey of discovery. <laughs> uh, thanks, Courtney. Uh, uh, hi everybody. Um, uh, I feel I'm on the back of the Canterbury Social Society. I am certainly not going to tell you how old I am. Uh, and I was one that was, that was not happy with the title of this, uh, this evening, Socialism for Dummies. Uh, to my mind, anybody who is here and interested in socialism and thinks that there's something badly wrong with the society in which we live is not a dummy. Okay, but, uh, so that's the first point. Secondly, nor am I the expert that the poster might have uh, suggested. However, I do have some thoughts and I do have some, some knowledge which I hope we can share and, and some questions that uh, I, hope, I hope we can answer. So, on that note, let's, uh, let's crack on because I'm being very good with my glass of water. I'd rather have a beer. But, uh. So, just quickly before we get started, like the format of this is is I have sampled some of my most thoughtful, dumb questions and I will ask them to Martin and if he says anything that really I really don't get, I will probably ask him to clarify, but it, it's going to be conversational. But the first part of the evening, the second part of the evening is some of you may be aware that we tend to call out asking for questions um, ahead of the lecture, which is if you have any burning questions from areas that you would like to know more about, we're going to answer them in the second half. So we actually have had quite a few sent in. We may only have time for those ones. However, you may have noticed we have these beautifully perforated forms, which perforate 
separated, so two parts. The first part is, if you have any burning questions, feel free to write them down. If we have time to answer them tonight, we will. Otherwise, we will attempt to potentially answer them in other forms that we will post your benefit. Um, and then the second part is the reading material. So for anyone out there that when they first learning about certain concepts and they thought, how oh, yeah, the foot taught me a lot of things or you know, something along that line, um, please write your recommendations down because we'll also post that um, for anyone that is interested in learning about you know, social stuff. Right, so that's that. Writing anything down that comes to mind um, over the next wee while. So we'll take a quick break um, at about quarter to eight, maybe ish. And then that's just for us to like re regroup with the questions while we're having a crack into questions. So, my first question to Martin What the heck is socialism? And how is it different from communism? Okay, um, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, you know, uh, I mean, if somebody sent the question in and said, there seem to be 147 different varieties of socialism, how can we decide which one to pick? Uh, and my answer to that is, well, there's 147 different ways probably of people thinking, how do we get to a socialist state? But there are certain fundamental principles that, that most socialists would agree on. Um, before I, I get to that, the difference between socialism and communism, well, I'm going, to be talking, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Karl Marx in a while, but basically socialism is the transitional stage on the way to communism, if you take Marxist theory, okay? So after the revolution, we will have a transitional phase of socialism, because obviously you can't just flick your fingers and everything changes overnight, and gradually over a period of time, we will move into a, a pure communist society. And we'll come back to what that looks like a little bit later. So, what the heck is socialism? Um, well, I think we could start with some very fundamental and basic things. I mean, socialists believe that the present system of society, the present world in which we live, is fundamentally unjust, unequal, and basically it is War. Okay, and there's somebody wrote a question in saying, and we're going to come back to that. Capitalism is proven to be the best way of running the world. Why do you want to change it? Well, hey, look around. Okay, let's look around at inequality. Let's look around at the war that's going on between Russia and Ukraine. Let's look at the starvation and the poverty. The list is endless. If that's the best way of running the world, then socialists simply don't agree. I think we could start with a, a sort of useful phrase which comes from the, the French Revolution really, liberty, egalité and fraternity. Liberty, equality and fraternity, or brotherhood, you know? That um, there is no need for society to be controlled in the way that it is by elites, liberty. There is every reason to believe in fraternity or brotherhood. It's amazing having times of crisis like church earthquake, that can't be now in church people do demonstrate fraternity and brotherhood. They come together, they help each other out. And then as soon as that crisis is over, we seem to revert to the same, the bad old ways. So, socialism is fundamentally, I think, about <laughs> equality. All members of society should be equal. And in that society, everybody should have certain fundamental rights. The right to a decent house to live in. The right to be able to feed your family and yourself, uh, you know, in, in a in a in a decent manner. The right to, dare I say it, free healthcare. The right to free education. The right to employment. The right to meaningful opportunities for rest and leisure. And a society where the economy is run and controlled in the interest of all and not in the interest of an elite. Society is now more unequal than it was a hundred years ago. That is terrible. After a hundred years or more of this so-called best way to run the world, capitalism, society is more unequal than it ever has been. Okay? We've got people dying in boats trying to cross the English Channel. 
to escape poverty, to escape oppression, uh, to escape, you know, to, 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 to protect them, themselves and their families. Um, so that, I think, is, is more or less where I come from in terms of the basic foundations of what socialism stems from. It is not the same, and you'll come across this thing, it is not the same as social democracy. And if you are going to do some reading about socialism or Marx or whatever, this might throw you a little bit. Because back in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, after the death of Marx, followers of Marx, supporters of Marx, were called social democrats. Okay, there was no such thing as a Marx then. You were a social democrat. Uh, and I'll sort of emphasize that by reading you what used to be clause four of the Labour Party constitution. To secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. There's liberty, equality, fraternity, for you if you like, writ in clause 4 of the Labour Party Constitution in the UK, but no longer. That socialist aim has now been ditched by the Labour Party and by Labour Parties throughout the world. There is nothing in the New Zealand Labour Party which would even approach that phrase. Um, social Democrats now argue for reform within a capitalist system. They just want to make things a bit better. They want to improve things a little bit. If we can listen to protections on the news tonight, okay, we want to raise the minimum wage by as if that is going to make a real difference to the way of life if people exist on the minimum wage. Might make a little bit of difference, but it's not going to fundamentally alter their lives, it's not going to get them a house, it's not going to get them the things that I said they deserve. So and I couldn't possibly do any session on socialism without quoting William Molly, so I'll just quote this from you, uh, for you. Nothing can argue me out of this feeling, said Morris, which I say plainly is a matter of religion for me. The contrast of rich and poor are unendurable and ought not to be endured by rich or poor. Four years ago, the two richest men in New Zealand increased their wealth by more than the 50 to 50% of the population here. Two men increase their total wealth by more than 50% of the population. That cannot be right. That's that. <laughs> what my answer? Hi. Now for this one. But, uh, okay. Yeah, no. Dang. That's why I'm here. That actually, look, and again, I haven't named the steel distribution company that I work for, but he gave himself a $600,000 bonus. Just because. He's done such a great job. Right. Where did the concept of socialism come from? Um, well, there, 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 you, you can trace the antecedents uh, of socialism, I suppose, all the way back to ancient society and the slave revolts, uh, you know, Spartacus in the Roman Empire and various other uh, revolts, right the way back to the Peasants' Revolt in 14th century England, uh, that wonderful phrase when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman, you know. Um, you can trace it back to the English Civil War and the levellers and the diggers, uh, the diggers who said that the land should belong to all, and everybody should have the right to fill the land and, and get the benefit thereof. You can trace it back to the French Revolution uh, and the overthrow of the monarchy there uh, and its replacement by a republic. So nothing springs sort of out of nowhere. Um, modern socialism, I would say, can be traced very clearly back to one man or perhaps two men. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Uh, Marx, the father of modern socialism, if you like. Uh, I think that's, uh, I'll just rest it there. Yeah. So it kind of seems like hundreds and hundreds of years ago, we sort of had like, you know, monarchy overlords, and now we just have rich overlords. Um, yes, I mean, there are still monarchies. 
but clearly the people who control the levers of power are the owners of Amazon and Google and, and, and the like. Uh, the people who have global monopolies uh, on all sorts of things. Okay, um, monarchies are often now purely figureheads. UK, Holland, places like that. Um, not to say that they're not unimportant in the scheme of things, but they still represent privilege. They still represent, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the British monarchs are vastly wealthy. You know, vastly wealthy uh, uh, on the backs of centuries of uh, exploiting their subjects. Uh, but they don't have the power that they did back in the 17th century, for sure. So, next question. Who is the power mark, and what will he get? <laughs> right, so, Marx was a philosopher, first and foremost. Um, and, however, he was a philosopher who said, Whereas previously philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, the point is to change it. Uh, and he looked uh, at a number of things. He said previously philosophers have only argued on the realm of ideas. You know, they will sit in a room and they will talk to each other uh, and they will argue uh, endlessly. But he did take his ideas from a, a whole range of uh, sources, right the way back to Plato in the Greek Republic, through the uh, English. Um, political economist Adam Smith and David Ricardo, from the Enlightenment, from French Socialists and so on, and particularly from the German philosopher Hegel, who came up with, the, with this notion of the dialectic, um, and which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. Uh, so, I say that Marx is the father of modern-day socialism because he has influenced political parties, trade unions, he sparked revolutions, he sought to start revolution, he himself was a revolutionary, he was expelled from Belgium, he was expelled from France, he was tied to reasonable activities in Germany, he wasn't just a philosopher, he was trying to carry out exactly what he said, that changed the world. But he's also stimulated arguments in philosophy, history, economics, and he's probably the father of modern sociology as well, in literature and in art. Um, and if you go on any publisher's website and type in Marx, you're going to get a list of books of people contesting his ideas, discussing his ideas. So he's hugely influential. And his worldview has sparked a whole range of discussions of the 147 different varieties of socialism that somebody mentioned. So if we look across the key phase of Marx's, uh, from each according to his abilities, each according to his needs. I think that is a sort of fundamental foundation of socialism, from each according to his abilities, from each according to his needs. Marx looked at history. So the first thing we need to look at uh, when we look at Marx is his, his theory of history, or historical materialism as, as it's been called. Because he said philosophers need to look at the world as it really is, not in just the realm of ideas, but let's look at history. And he saw history, uh, and he got this idea of the dialectic from Hegel, that history is a series of conflicts. Conflict between the oppressors and the oppressed. But the fundamental cause of these conflicts is economics. It's over who owns what, and who gets what. Okay? And out of each succeeding conflict emerges a new phase of society. And so we go on. So his phases of society, very briefly, primitive society. Which some Marxists have called primitive communism. I, you know, the, the, the era before the state, the era when people lived in kinship families and tribes, uh, and often with no fixed abode. Then he talks about slavery, slave states. Then he talks about feudalism, where you get land, whether rented or otherwise, from a landlord, and in return for that land, you have to perform services. And then out of the conflict between the feudal lord and the, and the peasants and so on, emerges capitalism. And you can, you can divide capitalism into two phases. The early capitalist phase, which is based around the rise of the middle class in the city-state, merchants and bankers and so on. And then the later phase of capitalism after the industrial revolution. When all of a sudden, you've gone from small-scale business and small-scale traders uh, and what they, into very large businesses employing hundreds if not thousands of workers. Um, and he says 
capitalism will usher in the final stage of this historical development, but it's produced the working class, or in Marx's terminology, the proletariat, which I think is in your little uh, handout there. And because there are so many of us, and we're talking, remember, Marx is right in the uh, uh, mid to late 19th century, when you've got factories employing thousands of workers, he says, when you've got workers together in masses like that, then they are going to be the next motor of change. And that the conflict between the capitalist and the worker is irreconcilable. It cannot be worked out. So all the previous philosophers, the idealists, who said, oh, this, all of humanity has common concerns, you know, we can live peacefully together, I said, no. There is no reconciliation between capitalists and workers. So, you've got that sort of uh, historical, historical materialism, Mark, that history and political events are the result of the conflict of social forces. Another key concept that you should have a look at is surplus value. So he says, right, every worker has got labour power. And the employer hires you today, let's say, for eight hours. I mean, Mark is eight, it's 10, 12, 14 hours. But he says, if you're hired for eight hours, you produce, and this is only a notional sort of number of hours and things, but you produce the value of your wages and the value of the raw materials and the value of the machinery and the value of the building in which you're working. You produce all of that in six hours. Everything above that that you produce is taken by the employer in the form of profit. So of course, if, if you've got hundreds of thousands of workers in your factory all producing that surplus value, that extra two hours of work for nothing, that results in vast profits. Okay, so it's quite a complex sort of topic to look at surplus value, but basically he's saying, you know, that we, we, when we work, we produce the value, we produce our value, what we need to subsist upon uh, in far less than the hours that we actually work in the factory or in the mill or whatever else we work in, in the office, in the library, in, in wherever, in your field, whatever it is you work in, field distributors. So, the surplus value is, is, is key, and that's what's going to cause the conflict. The workers are going to get fed up of working for the employer, producing commodities that he sells and makes a vast profit on, nothing of which comes back to us. The third thing that Marx looked at, I think, which is important, is the, the whole nature of work. And he talked about alienation. He says the worker becomes an appendage of the machine. Now, Marx was writing in an age where, you know, factories were the, the sort of the, the fundamental piece of the landscape, really. I mean, obviously, we're now looking at early 21st century where um, uh, large factories, certainly in New Zealand and certainly in the UK, are. Uh, uh, are vanishing. But nevertheless, the fundamental concept remains the same. That work, for many of us, is not pleasurable. It's something that we have to do to live. Uh, and he says, work becomes degraded, it becomes depersonalized, and it robs us of our creative ability. And he says, that alienation, allied to the notion of surplus value, will eventually make workers revolt. And he encourages them to join trade unions, he encouraged them to fight for what he called their rights. And the, the, the famous phrase from the Communist Manifesto, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. And then the final uh, sort of thought I want to leave you with on, on Marx is the notion of ideology. That the dominant beliefs and practices in our society reflect the interests and reinforce the power of the ruling class. What is the function of religion? is to make people say, okay, our reward will come later. Our reward will come in another life, not down on earth. You know, we're not going to get what we deserve here, but never mind. So religion is a form of social control. And we can go into a whole range of other forms of social control that uh, that notion of ideology would cover. Um, okay, so a little bit about Marx. Um, the library on Marx and the library of Marx's work is vast. Okay, but we will talk a little bit about some possible things that you could read that aren't uh, vast and, and too difficult. Yes, please write those down, please. I am not reading. Okay. 
so we've now touched on how Mark, who you said was the father. What do you use that terminology? I don't know. Papa Mark? Daddy Mark? <laughs> I'm aware of the uh, the 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 I mean, like post-punk, since Marx. Uh, or during, I mean, whatever. I mean, that, that is difficult because there are there are so many. I thought. I mean, you, you can't consider Marx without Friedrich Engels, to be fair. I mean, Engels was a collaborator. Engels actually wrote it in a more accessible fashion than Marx and popularized many of Marx's ideas. And he also completed volumes two and three of the master works of So I think you've got to consider Engels. Um, but yes, I mean, there were, there were a number of figures in the late 19th century. So, in, in the first and second international, which are the international socialist organizations, there were huge debates between Marx and the Kroonin, between Marx and Proudhon. Uh, between Marx and the German socialists like Kautsky and uh, Bernstein and others. Uh, and all of these are, are very important, but I think, you know, you really have got to be immersed in the sort of history of the socialist movement and delve down into that. But the question about the Kroonin is an interesting one because socialism and anarchism are, are, sl are slightly different uh, variations on a thing. I think you've got to look at Lenin uh, as the leader of the first, first successful revolution, socialist revolution, uh, and often, and from the date 1917, you often refer to Marxism-Leninism, i.e. Lenin took Marx's thought and adapted it to the Russian situation. Thereafter, Leon Trotsky, um, who heavily critical of the way the Soviet Union developed, and uh, uh, and you've got a number of um, socialist parties uh, that, that followed the idea of Trotsky and set up a fourth international, uh, the Trotsky International. I want to interject really briefly for the first time. What is the fourth international and the international? Because I hear it and I don't know what it is. Okay. First international in the 1860s, uh, the International Working Men's Association, Marx and Engels led it, and it was the first attempt to bring workers from different countries together in one. Uh, sort of international body. The second international from the eight, 1889, I think it was, um, where you have now got mass socialist parties in a number of countries. Uh, so that was the, uh, the the next attempt to create an international. So it's sort of like a period of time. Well, not, it wasn't intended that way. It was set in 1889, uh, and uh, they would have regular congresses where representatives from the socialist parties would come together. The third international was post-communist revolution, and that was an international where the communist parties of the world, those who now followed the Russian example, met. And the second international continued uh, as the what was now the social democratic international, i.e., people who believed in parliament and reform rather than revolution. And then the fourth international, those who follow the ideas of Leon Trotsky. Uh, so it, it, yeah, I don't think I need to spend too much time on that, but I apologise for. Oh, that in there. Uh, no, that's, that's okay. It was just like for me personally, it's something I've always heard, and I'm just always like, oh, you know, how is that? Yeah, so the, the, the fourth international seems uh, in, 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 in a form. Uh, the others have got by the wayside. Um, so, who else? Well, you then got another variant, of course, in Mao Zedong in uh, China. Um, so, if you're looking at communist revolutions, if you had Russia uh, and you had China as the two big ones, um, other thinkers, other names now. Well, those of us in the social society, those of you who know me, of course, will know that I bang on about William Mollick. Um, but he is a thinker that is still hugely relevant today. I think you could describe him as the first eco-socialist. Uh, and his view that every socialism 
every sort of revolution has to have a moral aspect to it. It can't just be about economics. You know, there's got to be a moral aspect. People have got to change the way they want to live. So I think Morris is hugely important, but for the 21st century, I think he's even more important than some of the names I've just thrown out. After that, though, I mean, the list is endless, certainly. You know, uh, I mean, uh, female thinkers, Alexander Kolontai, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, Sylvia Pankhurst, um, um, oh, I, yeah, uh, Eleanor Marx, okay, although, yeah, Eleanor Marx, although she, uh, um, well, not Eleanor Marx, yeah, definitely. I was trying to think of something more recent, actually, um, but, um, <laughs> no, no. um, yeah, So, has there ever been a successful aspiration of the socialist government? So, like, my understanding of, like, you know, the Lenin days was that they had a successful revolution, and then at some point it turned to shit. And uh, so, if we have ever had a successful iteration after a revolution, um, yeah, have we? And then, do we have any kind of actual socialist government in the world today? Uh. In one sense, that's easy to answer. No. Um, cool. However, Not cool, that, 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 yeah. is, that is a slightly simplistic answer. So, we did have a successful socialist revolution or communist revolution um, in Russia in 1917. Um, we did have an approximation of a, a socialist revolution in parts of Spain in 1936 during the Spanish Civil War, particularly in the South. Catalonia and what have you, where uh, uh, anarchist collectives were set up and self-governing and the like. We've had various successful um, social democratic governments, if you like. The first Labour government in New Zealand uh, was a successful social democratic government in that it didn't think the overthrow of capitalism necessarily, but it certainly sought to improve the conditions of the working class in New Zealand, and it did far more on housing uh, and other benefits than, than any any government since. Um, but he when, was an Aussie. Pardon? He was an Aussie. He was an Aussie, okay, but that doesn't disqualify him, though. Um, what we find, though, and then you think Chile in, 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 in 1973 would be another example where, where you know, um, uh, in Portugal is another case where we, we've had sort of revolutions. But what you note is, when I say no, we never have had one, every time. There's been the, the hint of a successful revolution, even of a sort of social democratic now, mild social democratic nature, the forces of reaction step in. So in Russia, they have a revolution, what happens? America sends troops, Britain sends troops, France sends troops uh, to smash the revolution because it's a threat. It's a threat to the capitalist order. Okay? So they, they, the Bolsheviks in Russia couldn't focus their attention on doing what they wanted to do in Russia, they had to fight the forces of reaction who were sending troops in. What happened uh, in Chile in 1973? Allende was overthrown by uh, the forces of reaction. Every time there is an attempt, even a sort of moderate reform of the system, you know, what happens? There is a flight of capital. And they say, oh, we're going to take our money out of the country. You say, oh, you can't do that, because if you do, people won't invest in this country. So take all their money out and put it somewhere else. You know, even in good old England, which as you can probably tell I come from, in the 1960s, early 1960s, before the Harold Wilson government, there was even a plot there to overthrow him, uh, believe it or not. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you watched that uh, program, SAS Heroes, that have just been on recently. You might think this is totally off the wall, but the guy who is lauded in that as this sort of wacky hero, you know, who uh, does all these amazing uh, feats of dead and do, uh, in later life, he was an arts reactionary who was involved in that plot to overthrow Harold Wilson. You know that, uh, and that is what happens. We've never had. Why have we never had a successful revolution? Because the forces of reaction have always stepped in, either militarily, the use of force, you know, the overthrow of the Spanish Republic in 1936 by Franco, 39, or they threaten to take their money out, or they do take their money out. Um, yeah, so. Is it just me, or is um, like sort of like the ruling or the rich classes or the people in power actually like quite good in tricking the masses into thinking that like life's really cool and this is the norm and capitalism, yay? 
because there's a lot of like some people that don't know really what socialism is and what it means to them. There's quite a, a negative um, view on it, right? And that's been built like over years and years, and it's still that way. I mean, how many of there are in the room right now versus like how many people are out there watching whatever freaking mass can some consumed TV shit is on right now? Like, what? Most of them are out in here. There's a small amount of people in here. So how do they like keep tripping off and presenting and capitalism is the one? Because these revolutions, right? Like when when they go out to stamp out, you know, the revolution, most of us will sit there and are like, oh yeah, that's cool. That's what that means. Well, this that's is fine. This is the thing from ideology, uh, and, and you're quite right that, that, that we are brought up to believe that change is impossible. You know, how often do you hear? Oh, that's the way it's always been. You can't change things. You'll never change things. Um, that, that is the function of ideology, that's what we're taught, you know, in schools, in universities, uh, on the media, you know, um, alternatives are very rarely put to us. And this is why, uh, I mean, Morris, amongst others, but, and Marx as well, said, what is needed is, is for people to be politicised, and by that I mean, we need, in the first instance, to educate people. I don't mean that in a um, patronising sense of saying, oh, you lot aren't educated, you know, in the sense of saying, look, there is another way. Uh, and what Morris uh, and others say is, you've got to lift your head up and not believe everything you're told and try to imagine a better way. You know, let's look at 2023. Famine, poverty, wars, climate change, New Zealand, people living on the streets, homeless. England, people are cold. Yeah, <laughs> people living on the streets, homeless. Uh, it, We've got to say that time, but there must be a better way. Let's try and engage a better world, a better society, a better way of living. Once we can get people to imagine that change is possible, then we can organise. Okay, so the number in this room are promising. You know, even even you might say, well, it's was a very small beginning, but you know, yeah, beginnings are small. You know, when Morris joined the socialist movement in the UK, there were 200 members in the whole country. You know, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, we've got to be able to imagine. But there is a better way of running things than the current system that we live under. So that kind of naturally actually leads into my final question before we have a switch through. Um, if that's the kind of way to do it, like, is that sort of happening in New Zealand? Like, is there any activism for socialism in New Zealand? Like, sort of movements for, obviously this is one here and we're all here, so we hopefully believe in it. Or to a point, we're here, right? Is, is there anything else that we can do in New Zealand to be more active in this space? Well, ob obviously I'm, I'm not from New Zealand, so I, I hesitate to speak about the, uh, the, 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 the sort of socialist scheme, for the better word, in New Zealand. I know there are other organisations, um, very small, uh, like this one. Uh, I mean, what happened in New Zealand was that the, the working class movement, whether it's the trade unions or the left, was literally smashed in the 80s by... Uh, Roger Douglas and Roger Nomics, uh, the industry employment contract that basically removed most of the rights of people to join trade unions and for trade unions to act. Uh, and therefore, um, and then that in turn has a knock on effect, I think, in terms of socialist activists and, and, and an arena in which you can operate and work and uh, try to get your ideas across. Uh, so there are other small groups, I, I wouldn't make an ISO is one, I think. Um, there are two or three others. Uh, I wouldn't dream of talking about those, Tom or somebody else. If anybody's got specific questions about the left in New Zealand, they could probably answer that better than me. Awesome. Cool. Well, I feel like I have far more of a grasp than I did 40 minutes ago. So thank you very much, Martin. So um, time is pressing on, so we have like roughly a three minute intermission. <laughs> I'll start a timer. And then it'll be question time. So if you have written a question, there are perforations. So sort of hand those up here, just in general to the front here. That would be great. And uh, keep your reading list though, because you might think of something in the next wee bit. So, uh,
is required. Um, it, uh, it isn't about taking control of the state system. It's about building um, separate working class organisations that then will eventually topple the capitalist order and run society in a, in a totally different way. And they, um, that seems to be, to me, the main point of convention. Um, there are probably more people in the room. This is one way or the other, actually. I feel, I feel quite middling on this question all the time. Um, who, who might have a stronger opinion on it? As far as um, why should an anarchist ally themselves with um, state socialists or the socialist movement, my answer would actually be more the question isn't really about the alliance of the socialist movement. The question is like, what is socialism in the context of the labor movement or the workers? So socialism has never been the entirety of the movement of the working class. And I think what Martin's talk earlier really influenced, uh, emphasized is that. This project that we're talking about is about the emancipation of the working class to, to take control of society because they, you know, for lack of better words, they have a right to by the fact that the working class does everything that makes society function. Okay. So, um, as far as alliances go, um, if you if you kind of agree that the solution to the question of social antagonism between the working class and the capitalist class is a communist or a socialist system, um, you're, you're still in a very small minority of the workers' movement. And if you agree that the working class is the, the only force in society that possibly achieve this, then it makes quite a lot of sense in my view to find the people that at least agree on those basic points and work alongside. But I guess the thing we can ask is like, what do we mean by an anarchist? Uh, he's coming from some people who say we're market anarchists. And this is an anarchism for dummies. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or you can find state socialists who have a really, you know, intense antagonism towards people who call themselves anarchists. And what do you mean by an alliance? I mean, um, our organisation has anarchists and socialists in it, but we're not a political party. I think should anarchists join an electoral party for socialism? Well, in what sense is it going to be an anarchist? You know, like, of course, there's, there's certain kinds of alliances that make sense and others that probably don't. So, that would be my answer. Um, not much to answer that, really. I mean, the, the question was interesting in that, in that it referred it solely to state socialism. Uh, and, of course, that, that was, uh, in the early days of the movement, a contention. Because uh, anarchists, the Kuhnin, Kropotkin and the like, said that uh, if you have a revolution which simply seeks to take control of the existing state, what you're going to end up with uh, is nothing approaching socialism. You're going to have a bureaucratic and centralised and hierarchical system, more or less the same as the one we've got. Um, but state socialists are only one form of socialists. You know, I mean, I, I, we talked earlier about the difference between socialism and communism, and Marx says that socialism is the transitional stage on the way to communism. To begin with, you can't fix the thing overnight and suddenly dispense with the whole system that was there before. You still, people still need to be fed, they still need to produce things, they still need to distribute things, and so on. Uh, but gradually, I mean, Marx talks about the withering away of the state. Personally, I don't see a massive difference between what anarchists want and what socialists want, particularly if you look at libertarian socialists, well, you know, uh, um, the, the state, if they are going to use it, it's going to, it's going to be a temporary. Uh, a temporary thing, uh, whilst we work out exactly how to organise the society in which we want. Anarchists tend to think that you can have the revolution and abolish the state overnight. And then the question is, well, what are you going to put into place straight away when you've still got to organise production and distribution and the like uh, in, in the short term and the interim? Personally, I want to see a very libertarian socialism based on small scale. Um, you know, small scale and localised communities taking charge of their own lives and working out exactly how they want to live. But that is not going to happen immediately. In my view, there's got to be a transitional stage uh, before we get to that. Um, so why should we be allied? Well, I think the answer to that is there's not enough of us at the moment that we can afford not to be. Let's have a revolution and then let's sort out what we want to do uh, once we've had that. Um, it might be a bit of a, a bit of a, um, what's the word? Probably not as a question in a sense, but, uh, but you know, I mean, there are instances throughout history of anarchists and socialists being aligned, and between the libertarian wing of socialism and 
uh, and therefore communism, for want of a better word, there aren't that many differences to be drawn. Yeah, I mean, that's the point I was going to make, is that, like, anarchism is as, as, as diverse as socialism, in a sense, that it's not like there is one thing. Like, I mean, libertarian communism, anarchist communism, you know, libertarian socialism, you know, there's, there's, there's different there's differences there, so... I mean, the joy of being a small organisation or a small yeah, movement, so in one sense, is... We can have these differences because we're not, we've never been in, we're not yet in a situation where we have to actually put these things in the practice. So now is the time to have these debates and discussions, fine. But, you know, sooner or later we don't have to organise uh, uh, into, into uh, a collective that can actually do something. Uh, as I say, you know, what happens when we all hands on next one, a better word, and then those differences can be ironed out later. But uh, I don't see a lot of difference between the libertarian and the socialism and, and anarchism uh, at all. I guess we can um, align with each other because who else will have us? So. <laughs> I'm going to ask this question next just because as we ran out of time, I really wanted to ask this question. And this question is from Shannon. I've got it. It's not because that one's funny. I have to ask the one about clothes and not, not in paper. <laughs> okay. Then we can do polyamory. Right. Get ready for that one, though, guys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I related obviously. Yeah. Well, we'll start with this one. Shannon, how do socialists approach the question of those not in paper? <laughs> so it's good enough of a question that I actually really thought hard about this and what's in like the new position as I looked down at them. So the language of socialism is one of workers and the working class. So anyone can be forgiven for assuming that socialism is for a particular kind of worker or for workers as they exist now under capitalism. And that's not the case. And this is a great question because it raises a few really important points about the nature of work. And so I want to talk first about um, parenting because that was the way that this question was initially uh, kind of posed. And so it was like, how do socialists approach the question of those not in paid work, i.e. because they were so solo parent, solo mum or whatever, um, receiving a benefit. And that's one circumstance that I'm going to start with because that's how the question was framed. But it's not the only reason why people might not be in paid work. So that's why I, I got well, yeah, like, like, away. Like my interpretation Own the means of production, if 
factory or the land and reproduce yourself through that ownership and the profits that come from that, then you are an owner or the bourgeoisie, that's the matter for something that we're talking about later, the bourgeois society, whatever. If you do not own the means of production, then you have no other option than to sell your labour in order that solely means of production, production must become a product of value, <laughs> then you are a worker. You're working class or you're the proletariat. And you are paid because we live in a society where only a few can own the means of production. If we own the means of production as a collective, pay would not be the same thing as it is now, fundamentally. There wouldn't be that. So what this means is that if you're a stay-at-home parent who is sustained by the profits that come from private ownership, you are an owner. And if you're a stay-at-home parent who is sustained by the benefit of the social wage, which is a term that we give to wages that are pulled by a taxation uh, for social welfare, then you are a worker. In either case, the issue of being a stay-at-home parent or not in paid work as a person is actually kind of irrelevant beyond identity. And the same goes for those who are simply out of work. When socialists talk about workers and working class, what we mean, or you know, what they mean, I assume, <laughs> is those who are sustained by the virtue of labour and not ownership. And so this brings me, I'm sorry, I've been really long-winded here, but to the last part about unemployment. So I feel it, it's really important for me to stress that it's capitalism and not socialism that requires an unemployed <laughs> class in order to fix the cost of labour. So as we have seen recently with inflation, a higher rate of employment equals more spending power for people. If you have employment, you have money to spend, uh, a greater demand on goods, and that also equals higher prices. I guess due to issues of supply, but often due to the profit motives and greed. <laughs> if, as it would be under socialism, production was organised according to need and not private wealth, and goods were similarly distributed, then the question of whether or not one works becomes one of your ability and circumstance, rather than one of economic imperative or if you have to work. It's about can you work? You know, uh, what are your specific circumstances in life? And what kind of work could she do? And to put it simply, Martin said this earlier, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. <laughs> One final word beyond the question of paid and unpaid work. Socialists do believe that the ability and the opportunity to undertake meaningful work is key to a person's well-being. Under socialism, and decoupled from the matter of pay, work becomes not only a matter of survival, but also a cause of pride and the expression of community. I'm really sorry for taking that like, into an essay as well. I really thought it was such um, an important question that I wanted to think about it quite clearly and like, state some, some really important um, points for us to build on. Thank you, Shannon. Sorry. <laughs> that was a great answer. Oh yeah, I forgot about the polyamory thing. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 I was ready for the polyamorous question. I asked the question basically, and it was like, under socialism, do we all need polyamorous? <laughs> during the <laughs> means <laughs> of reproduction, <laughs> during the means of reproduction, amazing pun, great job. <laughs> uh, that's about where uh, that ends. So, like, look, I read this question as a question about um, how monogamy marriage and the family, uh, the nuclear family, play within capitalism, and also the different kinds of social relations that might emerge under socialism or a different kind of you know, uh, economic system. And we all know the role of monogamy in marriage within capitalism, you know, in the family is well documented. We can go back to Frederick and Gilles, really we can speak about Eleanor Marx, Evelyn, we can speak about so many recent scholars, whatever. I actually think that the question is kind of a red herring because it's not about uh, monogamy, <laughs> uh, polygamy, which also comes up in terms of England and stuff, or about any of this kind of stuff, or the specifics of any kind of family structure or relationship structure, about whether or not that is deployed on the um, behalf of capital or capitalism. And so we know that the marriage has been monogamy, the family, whatever. Take you know gender roles and generally take half of the population out of the uh, 
do of fixing the cost of labour. So, you know, that makes it really competitive. <laughs> it also makes sure that that reproductive labour that is affected by the cost is done for free, which is great. Um, but, you know, polyamory can also serve those functions. We live in a world now where, you know, apparently monogamy is dominant, but two people have to work. And so we increasingly have to outsource um, some of the stuff that we need in our relationships in terms of childcare and intimacy and all that kind of stuff. We also increasingly live in housing situations that aren't to do with, you know, two adults and two children and a half a dog. <laughs> Relations evolve to meet the conditions that we live in. And, uh, you know, I think that, it, again, as I said, I think it's kind of a red herring to think about the specifics of, of what those relationships might look like. Ideally, under socialism, we wouldn't really care what people do with their intimate relationships, and they wouldn't be at the behest of um, any kind of economic imperative. So, uh, that's all I want to really say about that. Actually, I just want to just say that I'm not going to read the entire quote. Uh, but Eleanor Marx Evelyn, and she was Evelyn, who had a pretty easy divorce, as I understand it. But uh, <laughs> they also wrote a piece together um, where they defended monogamy. So whoever put this question in, I can say, monogamy is all for all my socialists. I don't know why you're automatically aligning with polyamory, this is absurd, and not sexually safe. <laughs> And that's my question. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you for answering that one, Shannon. I had been pondering it. And now, you know, my thirst for the answer has been <laughs> yeah. Um, So we do actually have more questions that were sent in, but I'm just wondering how you guys are feeling about time. Yeah, yeah? Okay, cool. Awesome. So, this one's from Martin. What is revolution versus reform, and is it applicable to modern Western first world society? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure really how to go on to this one. I mean, what I want to say is simple. You know, reform, uh, which is uh, I referred earlier to the Social Democratic Party. Reform is exactly what it says that within the present system. Let's make things a little bit better within the present system. You know, uh, examples New Zealand had a first class to post electoral system, now you can move to proportional representation. Um, people said that made things fairer, that it made your, made your vote count. Reform uh, today, Hitchens has raised the minimum age. That's an important way, not age. <laughs> 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 Uh, it's not the Gentile one, but the producer. But, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, that's a reform. You know? Uh, what they call a So, <laughs> reform is very simple. It's, it's, it's trying to make changes to improve the lives of people, but within the current system. Uh, and uh, while some reforms can be pretty far reaching, so back in 1945 in, in the UK, we introduced the National Health Service which for certainly 20 to 30 years was a massive improvement uh, for people in the UK in terms of their access to healthcare. Um, that was sort of reform, you know. Um, revolution is a fundamental change in, in, in the organisation of society. It's a fundamental change in terms of who controls society, who has a say in how society is run. It's a fundamental change in how the wealth of that society is shared out. Is shared out. Now, there was a, a strong strain of thinking in, in, in the early socialist movement that you could actually achieve a revolution piecemeal by if you continually introduce these forms and change them step by step, eventually that would mount up to a revolution. In fact, I see uh, one of the key socialists, uh, British socialists, uh, actually wrote a book called uh, The Evolution of Revolution. You know, the idea that slowly we will get there. Reform after reform after reform. Whereas the revolution says, that's not going to happen because every time you try that route, as I said earlier, the forces of reaction step in. Well, hold on, if, if we had a workshop on, hey guys, like let's form the revolution, like surely we'd get like SWAT teams or something. Yeah. Otherwise, look forward to my next session. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 the, 
Now I feel like I'm like, I'm going to read it. <laughs> then, uh, I'm going to read it. Um, joining it is, I was given the Karl Marx booklet, Wade, Labor, and Capital. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I'll ask it. Yeah. Would you like to ask it? <laughs> well, or would you like to hear me butcher yeah, asking I, I, I will correct you if you ask it. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> 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 I'm not afraid of Marxism or capitalism. All capitalism, I'm an eco-socialist. Right, so this is the eco-socialist question. <laughs> yeah. uh, in discussion with other members, I pointed out how it was the coal mine of the Queensland who lost the Labour Party the general election before last. They support the right. front. Yeah, no, I recognise that we Queensland is. <laughs> <laughs> um, they support the fossil fuel workers of Otago, whereas I do not. Socialism predates Marxism and communism, and they follow the type of socialist defined in insert Wikipedia link there, or eco socialism. This article has is the Marxist discussion, but I will be interested in your views. Exactly. Have you read that Wikipedia article? Uh, it's very long! Why not? <laughs> I, I will, I'll, I'll take the lead on that and talk to you because um, um, I, I want to very simply say this. Uh, Marx and Engels have a lot to say about eco-socialism and about the environment. Marx talks about a metabolic rift between humanity and nature, which he says is disastrous for both. He talks a great length in Capital about the impact of capitalist agriculture on the land, the distillation of rivers, the way in which uh, the soil is, is eroded. Engels talks about coffee planters in Cuba, cutting down the trees and thereby... And, 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 and so on and so on and so on. So, Marx and Engels have got a lot to say. Uh, and they are definitely, definitely argue that you cannot have a socialist state, or whatever you want to call it, without paying huge attention to the environment and to nature and the relationship between man and nature. William Morris is another one who I would argue was the first eco-socialist who is absolutely and fundamentally on the same lines that socialism is about a reordering of the relationship between man and nature because it is down to man as a result of capitalism that has destroyed and destroyed the environment. So. I'll leave, I'll, I was going to answer the bit about the cleaning and proper fuel workers, etc., 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 but there is absolutely no contradiction between Martin and Engels and between Morris and between other socialist thinkers. And I think one of the reasons that I disagree with uh, a lot of people in the Green Movement and a lot of people in Extinction Rebellion and so on is that they are only fixated on one thing. And they don't realise that everything that they're protesting about is actually a result of the capitalist system. You can't separate the two out, you know? Now, a lot of eco-socialists are now beginning to do that. I mean, it's called a, you can talk about a Red Green Alliance or a Green Red Alliance or whatever you want to call it. But a lot of so-called <laughs> so eco-socialists, not so-called, but socialists, are now recognising that actually what we need is fundamental system change. That you're not going to achieve what you want in environmental terms by trying to go through Parliament or getting governments to change their mind. Because what are we saying at the recent top summit and what have you? It's going to be too bloody late. Carbon neutral by yeah. 2050. It's going to be yeah. too bloody late. So, yeah. so, uh, so I just want to say that there is no contradiction between us. But in our target, I think what I just said to what Martin said, I think this this the ecological movement or what is really part of what is these days and what I consider a climate change movement and talk about carbon. Um, okay, 
with with the flash supporting fossil fuel related or even that our our reliance on fossil fuels. So we're thinking about New Zealand and the fossil fuel workers are in target. If they all fix our results tomorrow and the mine is closed, our use of fossil fuels will not change one iota. Not at all. At all. Instead, what we do is we're important. So not only that, because we will ship them over the over the ocean, <laughs> and then we will ship them. This idea that, that 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 the solution is to just close down these industries. Is it what you want? Uh, yes. I'll, I'll, yeah. But I think there's this, this idea that like you know uh, what what is a green economy for New Zealand? The green economy for New Zealand is not giving all of our industrial production and all of our um, all of our Need for these resources onto other countries that we then import and they hear they're green. You know? So, and the other part of it to me is like the question is like, do we support fossil fuel industry workers? Do we support workers who do lots of things that we may think are not ideal? Yeah. What am I? Well, no. I think, <laughs> what what the I, same thing. What am I Fossil fuel. Yeah. Yeah. Who sells used cars? <laughs> and I, you know, a lot of people don't love used cars. Used cars. But ultimately, speaking, you know, um, uh, the, the people who decide what is what is produced and how it's produced, they're not the workers in the industry. We live under a dictatorship of capital. Capital decides what is done. And people selling their labour in order to reproduce themselves are basically, in my view, never uh -huh. right? what is the last three of the Pretty much. Pretty much. So uh, I can sell my labour to a library, which is extremely nice for me because there's very few people who take the issue to the library. But I know, yeah, but I know, the library doesn't exist. I mean, a lot of the time stuff done by somebody somewhere, whether it's here, whether it's in the whether it's, um, you know, the, the example in Britain is the same, where they close down coal, coal mines, and now the same coal is just shipped across the Atlantic and they still burn it. You know, it's, it's the same thing, literally, it's, 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 it's logical. But, um, you know, and I think this, you know, do we support the, the working class just because they do something that, you know, is not ideal? Who, 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 who am I? Are they killing you? No, they're not. Yes, they no. are. They, 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 they are selling their labour to the workers. They're not selling their labour. And if they don't do it, somebody else will. They're like drug dips. Yeah, this is like Albert Albanese. Albert said, in Australia, we're going to have to sell our coal, someone else will. Well, yes. that's the drug dealer argument. If they don't buy the drug from us, they'll buy it from someone else. But anyone who's talking about like huge tons of cocaine and stuff, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, so, my question is, am I in argument while this is Martin? Martin is a communist. I am an eco socialist. Are we in opposing no. direction? I don't think so, no, but I mean, you want to go and say, I'm a dummy and, and I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> no I think it's, it's the, if the goal is to go down to a mine and start selling workers that they're, um, that they're killing us, then yeah, I am in the opposition to that. Personally, yeah. maybe I'm not, but I, I actually know. Let's take a concrete, concrete example apart from the one you gave So, you know, I was around in the miners' strike in, in the UK. So, you've got people in communities uh, all over the country, particularly in the north of England. Where the only source of employment is in the mining industry, either down the mine or related to the mine. Right. Okay, right, okay. And at that time, of course, we were even more reliant on fossil fuels than we are now. But when they closed those mines, there was no attempt whatsoever to put in place alternative sources of employment, introduce new sources, get new jobs, new to employ. To employ those miners. So we cannot blame we cannot blame workers. We cannot blame anybody for taking a job when that is the only job that exists. Uh, and when, as Tom quite rightly says, we knew then, and it's been proven since, that when they closed down those mines, all they were going to do was import coal from elsewhere. Okay, because that was not only that, that was a pure and simple attempt to smash a trade union. You know, and that, and that was the ultimate. Logic of, of capitalism under Thatcher, uh, as it was here under Roger Douglas, you know. Uh, so, so no, so yeah, we always support workers in struggle. We, we, you can't, you can't argue with a, a Queensland coal miner or an Otago coal miner and say oh, what you're doing is wrong. Well, 
Give me another job then to support my family. Give me another job. Oh, you're going to change. There's also like a lot of We're on the same side, uh, and, and we should also be on the side of workers in struggle. And, and when we have a, a socialist society, then this question will become irrelevant because. Uh, Can I hate the player? Hate the game. Basically, yeah, basically what Martin says. Um, who decides what is made, how it's made, and why? At the moment, it's not us. It's not workers. It's not people going down the pit. It's um, so once you know, yeah. Um, once we're actually, once we have uh, some sort of like popular sovereignty over like why we produce and how we produce and introduce and and so on, that's a great time to bring up the question about how do we actually organise society in a way that doesn't exploit. We're running out of time. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, no, but it is. We need to start thinking about the socialism very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly. So, 
Solstice would say, or certainly this Solstice would say, that in the short term, we need to get much more democratic control of the police force. Dare I say it, the police forces where they are armed need to be disarmed. Uh, and that we need to put a lot more of our money and our resources into prevention and into in improving people's lives so that crime no longer becomes something they need to consider as an option. Yeah? But eventually, I would hope, I mean, you might find a bit tight this with the neighborhood watch type approach, but eventually, I would hope, under a socialist society, there will come a time when actually local neighborhoods and communities can police themselves in inverted commas, you know, and not just people up in uniform uh, and arm them in order to patrol the streets. But it's not going to be a short term fix. The short term fix for me <coughs> is to invest more in the things that prevent crime and get much more democratic control over the police uh, and over the way they operate and do away with bloody snap squads and swap squads and all these sorts of things. Can I just like to give examples of that? Like, with, I, I think of things like in, in Egypt and even Sarajevo and places like that, and uh, sort of like social change that was occurring. That when the when the when the, the you know the, the police forces and the, the, the forces of the state who were broken down, a, a lot of the community self policed, and there was a lot of that kind of initial kind of like communities taking care of. Those aspects of, of society. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's like with mutual aid. It's like things, things happen in communities when, when there's a need that people will organise collectively. Yeah, in Spain too, during the Civil yeah. War and, and various yeah. other places. But it has been shown that people can actually move their own communities mm -hmm. uh, far more effectively and. Uh, uh, <coughs> Thank you, Martin, thank you, Paul, thank you, Shannon. Thank you all for coming. Um, so just before we wrap up, um, if you have written a book recommendation, can you please just jump in, I mean, please send yes. up the book. Uh, we will collate them and release them for everyone's benefit. Thank you so much for contributing to that. Please leave the pens because I have borrowed them from work. Thank you. We will have a look at these and Yes, for the questions that we didn't have time for, thank you to everyone who participated who asked the questions. Thank you all for being here. Hope you learned something. Yep. And, and if you um, want to become a member, so I still need you uh, to we have a mailing list at the door. You can you don't have to become a member. You can just like find out about what we're up to. You can also go online and talk to any of us about becoming a member. It's like Thirdly, to get a lot of good savings, get a little memory, etc. Have a great life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And buy a copy of Common Where We Can Buy it. Back to you. Oh, I think I pretty much did it. Thank you very much.